Page 20, the Grand Staff. I haven't done anything prior to page 20 in this book because I feel like you can go through all of that and read it and understand it. And there are plenty of other videos to teach you how to read music and all that. If you have any questions, you are more than welcome to ask me. I'll try and answer them. However, let's go ahead and start here with the Grand Staff. The Grand Staff consists of two or more staff, it could be three staffs, but most time it's just two staffs. A staff is those five lines, a group of five lines, okay. There's two of those. They're connected with a vertical bar that connects them all at the beginning of them. And there's a curly brace in front of them. That makes it a grand staff. It's got to have that curly brace. Uh, keyboard instruments, most all keyboard instruments and maybe a few other instruments use a grand staff. Now, the they have a treble clef and a bass clef they're showing here. And that's handy and that's what you'll see most of the time, but that's not what's required. You could have two bass clefs or two treble clefs or whatever. It's whatever the music has to, needs, right? For the most part, we're going to see a treble clef on the top and a bass clef on the bottom. Now, also to go along with that, when you're playing them, it's just convenient. It's not a rule. Just convenient that because the right hand is up near the top part of the keyboard, then the right hand will play the top notes because it's handy. And so the left hand will play the lower notes because it's closer to the lower part of the keyboard. Sometimes the hands will cross over, but for the most part, when you see the music, you figure, okay, the right hand's going to play the top staff and the left hand's going to play the bottom. It's not always the case. But in most cases, that's the way it'll be. And that's where you start. When you look at a piece of music, that's what you're thinking first. And then you look at the music closely to see if that's really the case or not. We're starting out real simple, so that's the case. In page 20, when you're doing playing on the grand staff, the right hand is going to play the first line here in C, what we call C position. Because if the first note is a middle C, right? on the staff. That's a C, that first note. And if you do that, you put the other fingers next to it, you have a five finger position because each finger gets in a key and the bottom note is a C. So we call it a C position. So if I say put your hand in C position, that's what you do. Then the left hand will play the second line because that's written in the bass clef, the bottom staff, and that's down here. The first note's a C. You just put the other fingers where they go and the keys next to it. And once again, we have a C position in the left hand. So you're actually in C position in both hands. It doesn't have to be. It could be anything. Just about anything goes here. But for right now, that's what it is. Now, it's important that you understand every little symbol you see in the music. Don't skip over them. Oh, it's not important. I'll get it later. No, no. This is later. You, you get it now. Okay? So we talked about the grand staff, the clef signs. Let's talk about the time signature. The time signature tells us what the rhythm is going to do. How the rhythm works. Uh, we say it tells us how to count. The time signature controls a lot of stuff. Music has rhythm. We have rhythm all over. And the time signature kind of lays out the overall groundwork for how the, the rhythm or how the counting is going to work for that piece. Now, a time signature can change in the middle of a piece. It can change any number of times. So it gets fun. And some pieces where I've, I've played where it changes every measure. It's different. It's like, what are they doing? huh? But it can, and it just simply tells you how to count. The top number tells you how far to count. How many beats in a measure? There's four, so we're going to count to four. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, blah, 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 blah. Okay. The bottom note tells you which note you're counting, because we got to know what we're counting. And a four means quarter note. It's kind of a silly way of doing it, but that's what they've done it. So think of four quarters and a whole, okay? They're four quarters and a dollar, or they're four quarters. A quarter note is represented by the four. These notes 
in this piece, most of them are quarter notes. Now they don't really look like quarter notes because they put the name of the note in the middle of the note. But really it's supposed to be a solid note. It's not supposed to have the letters in the middle of it. Right? They're just doing that to help you out right now. And it's important that you memorize those as quickly as you can. The notes on the staff. Know what they are. Know what the names of the notes because we talk about them all the time. And on the keyboard. The names of the keys on the keyboard. There's a lot of C's on the keyboard. I got a C here and here and here and here and here. They're just all over the place. We're just loaded with C's, right? But there's only one C that matches the first note in this piece. And that is this C. So when you see that note in the staff, you play this C. Alright? There's exceptions to that. Don't worry about them. Let's keep it simple right now. It's just here. It's called middle C because it's sort of in the middle of the keyboard. It's not exact, but it's close. And it's a C. And you know a C is the bottom note in a group of two. So you just look at group of twos and you find the bottom note. Those are C's. Memorize it. It's important. So that's how we're doing this. We're translating from what they're written into, you know, what we understand it, and then the piano will turn that into music. Isn't that wonderful? It's like a collaboration between us and the piano and the written music and whatever. They're giving other things, clap and count and play and have all kinds of goodies, and I'm going to skip all that. I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in the music. There is a note there underneath the bottom staff there in the first line says about the whole rest. A whole rest is that little box that hangs below the next to the top line. Most cases it's next to the top line. The important thing is it hangs below the line. Okay, And a whole rest is equal to a whole note. Every note has an equal rest. Okay, A quarter note has a quarter rest. A half note gets a half rest and blah blah blah. Okay. A whole note would get four quarter notes. Or in 4-4 four, four time, a whole note gets four counts. We don't have a whole note in this piece. I'm just telling you that. Because we do have a whole rest, and it's the same thing. A whole rest is equal to four quarter notes, or four quarter rests. And in 4-4 four, four time, it's equal to four beats. So in the left hand of this first one, the left hand... They're telling you to rest for four counts in each measure. You see, you have to account for every beat in every measure. It's a rule. Four, four time, every measure has to have four counts. So you have to account for them. So in the right hand, you got the notes doing it. In the left hand, you don't have anything. What do you do? You use rests, and that accounts for them. In the second line, it's the right hand that gets the quarter rest, because the right hand isn't actually playing anything. That's the way it works. Now, I will warn you, later on, the whole rest can actually just represent a whole measure. And it doesn't matter how many counts it is. It does dual duty here. It can be four beats, or, I mean, sorry, it can be four quarter notes or four quarter rests. It can also just be a whole measure, because not every piece has four four time. Not every piece is going to have four counts in a measure. You've got all kinds of other time signatures. But regardless of what they are, they can still use a whole rest to represent a whole measure. So, just so you know, when we get there, I'll remind you. Now, one more thing before we start playing. At the very end of the piece, the end of the second line, you see what they call double dots. It's more than just the double dots. You've got to have the two lines, a thick line and a thin line, and the dots. All of it together. Okay, so we're kind of mixing things here. The lines, the thin line and the thick line is the symbol for the end of the piece. Forget the dots for a moment. Just take them out of your mind for a moment. I'm just talking about the lines. That's the symbol for the end of a piece. When you get there, that's, that's it. You're done. A repeat sign is what this is with the dots on it. And a repeat sign is a thin and thick line with the dots. 
but a repeat sign could be anywhere in the piece. You're still going to have the thin and thick line and the dots wherever, because that's a repeat sign. So it's a little confusing the way they do it when they put a repeat sign at the end of the piece like this because it's actually two symbols in one. It's a repeat sign, but after you repeat and you come back, it's the, it's the final, it's the finish. It's the end sign, the done sign, the complete. We're all kaput, right? Right. So let's play this together. And the idea of playing it together is so you listen to what you're playing and to what I'm playing to make sure we're playing the same note at the same time. So you get the correct notes and you get the correct rhythm. In this piece we have quarter notes. We already talked about quarter notes. They're in 4-4 four, four time it's a beat, right? So we count in quarter notes. But you also have half notes. A half note is two quarter notes. So you're simply going to hold the half note down for two counts in 4-4 four, four time. If I just play a C by itself, Actually, because my fat belly, I'm going to play a C up here. I just picked a note, okay? I just do a C. I'm not, forget the music for a minute. Just a C. And if I do quarter note C's in 4-4 four, four time, I'm going to go 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 4. 1, 2. See, those are, I'm counting to 4, and those are quarter notes, so it's in 4-4 four, four time. A half note would get two of those. So it would be one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. That's a half note. Well, now we mix them all up and you get this and that and whatever. So then I can, com I can combine the two and I get two quarter notes and a half note. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. You can find. I do the half note and then the quarter note. So I go one, two, three, four. One, two, three. You get the idea. A quarter note and four, four time is one count and a half note is two. And that's really what I'm trying to drill into you. That's what we have in this piece. So let's play this together. And we are going to play it twice because it is repeated. The repeat sign means go back to the beginning and play it again. It means more than that, but I'll let's skip that for now. Let's keep it simple. Just go back to the beginning and play it again, okay? Now, a challenge for you, which seems to trip up a lot of people. I need you, when you have music like this, I need you to keep your eyes on the music while you're playing. People have a tendency, they look at the first note, and then they look down at the keyboard and play it. Look up at the next note, and they look down at the keyboard and play it. And then the next note, and they look down and play it. Don't do that. Stay focused here, and learn to know which finger is on which keys. You've got to know that if you're going to play the piano. It's really important. So once you put your hand in that C position, you need to know that your thumb's on the C and your little finger's on the G or whatever. You, know, you need to know every note the finger's on. So as you're playing at the first note, you're, you're staring at the music. I'm staring at you, but you st you gotta, you're not looking down is my point. And then you play the next note and the next note. So learn to play this piece without looking at the keyboard at all. You shouldn't need to. In fact, you ought to be able to play all these pieces for quite a while without looking at the keyboard eventually. All right? You might have to look down at first to get the idea, but you're not done with the piece until you can play it without looking. Let's play it together. I'm going to count us in. I count us in according to the time signature. So if there's four beats to a measure, I'm going to give us four counts and then we'll start. Don't ask me why. I don't know why. I've always done it that way. Most people do. We just, the time signature controls the counting, period. All right. So go ahead and put your hands in C position. Uh, let's go. Now, I know the left hand doesn't play until the second line, but put both hands on the keyboard and have them ready to go. All right. One, two, ready, go. Go. <laughs> 